So uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I should say that, this, that, that much of this was actually done about uh, six years ago, but uh, we never ended up uh, writing up the, the results except in a conference. And uh, since then, we've managed to improve them and so on. So uh, hopefully, this will be of interest. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that's particularly relevant to the continuous setting. And uh, so I'm going to start out by spending some time describing what the entropy power is and introducing the STAM region, which is some kind of uh, analogous notion to uh, the entropy region, but for sums of random variables instead of joint distributions. And uh, after providing some motivation, I'll present our main results, uh, which basically are something that's an outer bound, something that fails to be an outer bound, and uh, some convexity properties. And then I'll uh, end with some open questions. So uh, let's uh, start with something that is familiar and that we have uh, seen in a lot of the talks this week. Uh, so if you have a discrete random variable with a probability mass function on some finite or countable set, then the entropy is just uh, the negative sum of the probability log the probability uh, summed over all the uh, values that your random variable takes values, uh, I mean summed over the alphabet that your random variable takes values in. And uh, uh, we know not lots of nice things about this notion of entropy in particular it's a very meaningful measure of randomness or of information, and it's the smallest number of bits needed on average to describe x, right? which is one of Shannon's uh, main results in his 1948 paper. And uh, uh, if, if you have n discrete random variables, let's say x1 through xn, and they live on the same probability space, then any subset of them is also a discrete random variable. So one can talk about the joint entropy, which is just the entropy of the of x sub j, that is the xi indexed by j. Uh, that being a discrete random variable also has an entropy, which is just the joint entropy. And then uh, it's a classical fact that the map from this set of subset of indices j to the entropy of x sub j is a non-decreasing submodular function. Uh, and uh, the, the, the problem of characterizing the class of all such maps is precisely the problem of characterizing the entropy region, which many people have talked about lately, right? So, um, so this is some region. I mean, if you, if you look at this as uh, all such maps where you don't allow the null set here, the, then this is, uh, this is a subset of r to the 2 to the n minus 1. And for n 4 or more, uh, as as we know, this is a very difficult problem. Okay, so so this is uh, this is uh, this is to make a connection with the things that have happened so far. Now let me uh, motivate what we are going to do in this talk. So instead of looking at joint entropy, I'm going to look at the entropy of sums of random variables or vectors, which is of course equally ubiquitous in information theory. I mean, if you are looking at uh, typical, uh, you know, uh, cha communication channels and so on. Additive noise is a very typical assumption for, is a very typical model of a communication channel. And so looking at entropies of sums is a very natural thing to do. Uh, and uh, th the question is, can we systematically study uh, inequalities for entropies of sums just as we study the entropy region, which, re which represents inequalities for joint entropy? So why should we care? The motivations come from many areas. So for example, in information theory, uh, some of our work has already led you know, in this direction of uh, sort of obtaining refined entropy inequalities for sums, uh, has already led to advances in the understanding of degrees of freedom of the interference channel. So in particular, this paper of Sturz and uh, Bolkskai. Um, and uh, in probability, it is related to many basic questions like the entropic central limit theorem, which I will briefly mention. Uh, and there are also motivations from convex geometry. So it turns out that um, there are analogies between inequalities in convex geometry, like the brun minkowski inequality, and inequalities for entropies of sums, like the entropy power inequality. And this turns out to be a, a very fruitful, but also puzzling analogy, because, you know, there are many parallels. The m many inequalities in convex geometry have versions in information theory and vice versa, but the parallelism is not exact. So, so it does break down in some places. And to understand exactly how this parallel works, 
uh, and to try to understand these information theoretic inequalities and convex geometric inequalities from a unified point of view is an interesting problem that has been pursued in a number of places. And uh, it's also related to the so-called geometrization of probability program, which was pioneered by Keith Ball and Vitaly Milman. Uh, and there have been many recent developments in this program as well. OK, so, um, so, so, so what I've done is to, is to motivate broadly the study of inequalities for the entropies of sums. Now, when I talk about the entropy of a sum of random variables, clearly this makes sense, you know, unlike Unlike the, ent unlike the joint entropy, which makes sense in, uh, you know, your, your alphabet can be any set whatsoever, it doesn't matter. But for entropies of sums, I need my set to have some structure, some sort of addition operation so that I can talk about a sum. And if I ask for the minimal, you know, reasonable structure which, which comes along with a binary operation, I would ask for my alphabet to be a group. Right? So, so any, any, I, I can look at random variables taking values in any group, I can, and then I can talk about sums of random variables. And, uh, and in fact, you can ask these questions about entropy inequalities for sums in a, in a general group setting, and there are, ma there are many things that can be said already in fairly general settings. So for example, uh, so some aspects of uh, general theory for uh, entropy inequalities in locally compact abelian groups are developed in work with Yanis Kontayanis, which I'm not going to talk about today. What I am going to talk about today is, uh, uh, is focusing on a very special group, namely RD. Okay, so I'm looking at random vectors and addition in RD. Okay, so, so before I uh, go further, let me explain what entropy on RD looks like. So if you have a random vector uh, x, uh, Okay, if you have a random vector x with some, with some density f on rd, so this is a joint density, f is a function of x1 through xd, uh, then the entropy of x, uh, I mean, often this is called the differential entropy, but I'm not going to bother saying differential each time, I'll just say the entropy. The entropy of x is minus the integral of f log f with respect to Lebesgue measure. And uh, we, we should note that this has some properties of discrete entropy, but not others. This is something that Terence also uh, uh, emphasized this morning. Uh, unlike discrete entropy, differential entropy is not always non-negative. So it can take any value from minus infinity to plus infinity, and in fact, it need not be defined, because this, this integral need not be defined. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and it also doesn't have the nice invariance properties of discrete entropy. Discrete entropy is preserved by bijections. Differential entropy is not. However, it is preserved by other things. For example, it is preserved by translations and it is preserved by uh, linear transformations of determinant one. And those, those properties are actually very, very nice and useful uh, uh, and you know, help you to recover some of, the, some of the nice things that can be said for discrete entropy for differential entropy. Okay, so, uh, so that's differential entropy, but as, as Terence mentioned this morning, differential entropy can be negative, and that means that it's, that it's not a very nice quantity. If you want to think of it as a measure of information, it's not, it's not suitable for that, because it can be negative, and, and also because you know, there's no operational characterization of differential entropy. It's, you, you can't, I mean, the number of bits needed to specify a real number is uh, infinite. Uh, and uh, so, so, so it's, uh, you know, one can only think of it as a measure of information loosely. But perhaps a better way to, uh, you know, to, to think of this as a measure of randomness is to take the exponential of the entropy. And it is customary to, in fact, uh, uh, take the exponential of twice the entropy over the dimension. So if x is a random vector in Rd, then you look at the exponential of twice the entropy over the dimension. And this object is called the entropy power of x, okay? So this is standard abuse of notation. We write h of x and n of x, even though these are functionals depending only on the density of x. Uh, and the entropy power can range anywhere from 0 to plus infinity. The entropy itself can range from minus infinity to plus infinity, as I mentioned. So the entropy power ranges from 0 to plus infinity. And you can think of this as a measure of spread, okay, like the variance. Okay. Um, okay so we will only consider random vectors with finite entropy, hence uh, in that case the entropy power is a non-negative real number. Okay? So, uh, in, so how do we interpret this quantity um, and why, why do we have this 2 over d in the exponent? Let me briefly explain that. 
So, so one can think of entropy power as an inexact analog of volume of a set. So if you have a set, uh, okay, so, so, so if, you have a, if you have a compact set in RD, and let's say U sub A is the uniform distribution on this uh, compact set, then the entropy of U sub A is just the log of the volume of A. So I use modulus for volume, uh, which means the entropy power is the volume of A to the 2 over D. This still doesn't explain why we should take the 2 over D -th power. But the reason we don't just define uh, entropy power as the exponential of the entropy is because the correct comparison is not to uniform distributions but to Gaussians. I mean, we want to mimic, uh, so, so we want the entropy power to be to random variables or random vectors, uh, what, the, uh, what the volume to the 1 over D is to sets. So, so this is because um, we will later, I mean, okay, so, so this, is, this, is, this is actually an aside, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the classical, uh, the Brun-Minkowski inequality, which is a classical inequality in convex geometry, says that if you have two subsets A and B of RD, then volume of A plus B to the 1 over D is greater than or equal to volume of A to the 1 over D plus volume of B to the 1 over D. And we somehow want to make an analogy between inequalities for entropy power and inequalities for uh, such as this, which means the functional for sets that we're interested in is volume of A to the 1 over D. And this has a very nice geometric interpretation. It's just, I mean, up to a universal constant, this is proportional to the, this is up to, up to, a, up to a constant, this is equal to the uh, radius of the ball which has this, of the Euclidean ball which has the same volume as A. Right? If you take a Euclidean ball which has the same volume, then the radius of that ball is going to be like the volume to the 1 over D. So, so, so analogously, uh, you can think of the entropy power because of the way that, uh, because of the formula for the entropy power of the Gaussian, which can be easily calculated. The entropy power turns out to be entropy power of X is up to a universal constant. The variance of the spherically symmetric normal that has the same entropy as X. Okay, so for any, for any X, look at, a, look at the spherically symmetric normal that has the same entropy, and then the variance of that normal is precisely the entropy power of X. Okay? So that, that's, that's why we use this normalization. Okay, so a second aside is that, uh, so, so this is the inequality that I was mentioning as a, as a parallel to the Brun-Minkowski inequality. This is the entropy power inequality. And it says that if you, if you take two independent random vectors, X and Y and RD, then the entropy power is super additive. Okay? This is a fundamental inequality in information theory. It was, uh, it was uh, stated by Shannon in his 1948 paper, but he had an incomplete proof. Uh, the first rigorous proof was given by Stam in 1959. And since then, this has attracted lots of attention and been seen lots of applications in information theory and many other areas. Uh, so one, one application of it is uh, related to the central limit theorem. Uh, and uh, let me just briefly sketch that. So, uh, so, so one pertinent fact here is that if, let's just look at the one dimensional case. So if you look at all densities on the real line with uh, let's say mean zero and variance sigma squared, then the one that has maximum entropy is the, is the Gaussian with mean zero and variance sigma squared. This is, a, this is a very easy fact to check, which was observed by Boltzmann in, in uh, over a century ago. Uh, and uh, so, so if you just apply the entropy power inequality to the case where X and Y are IID, independent and identically distributed, uh, I'm sorry, this should be capital N, not, not capital H. That's a, that's a typo. Everything here should be capital N. So, so th this would say that the entropy power of X1 plus X2 is at least twice the entropy power of X1. And because of the way that entropy power scales, Entropy power of a times a, con a times a, a constant times a random variable is the constant squared times the entropy power. So this is saying that the entropy power of x1 plus x2 over square root of 2 is at least the entropy power of x1. And entropy power is a monotone function of the entropy. So this, this, this inequality also holds for the entropy, which means that if you are looking at the normalized sums in the central limit theorem, the entropy is increasing at least when you go from the first step to the second step. The question of whether the entropy is increasing at every step was open for a long time, and that was settled by Artstein, Ball, Barth, and Naur in 2004, combined with a result of uh, Andrew Barron in 1986, 
which says that uh, the entropies of these normalized sums and the central limit theorem converges to the entropy of the Gaussian, we get that if xi are independent identically distributed random variables with mean 0 and variance sigma squared and you look at this normalized sum which, which I mean the central limit theorem, the classical central limit theorem tells us converges weakly to the Gaussian. Uh, what we have in this case is that in fact the entropies converge or equivalently you have not just convergence in distribution but convergence in the sense of relative entropy which is a very strong notion of convergence. Okay, so this is this is again just an aside for some motivation, uh, but let me move on. The one thing that we have done here which is pertinent to what I am going to say is we have introduced the entropy power inequality which is one basic uh, constraints on, constraint on entropy powers of sums. Okay, so now I want to introduce the STAM region which is the basic object of study. Uh, so let x1 to xn be independent random vectors in Rd with the entropy of the sum being finite. Now we write square bracket n for the index set 1 to n and for any subset of uh, square bracket n we define the subset sums y sub s which is just the sum of the xi over i and s. Okay, so this is the, I am doing the exact analog of the entropy region but for sums of independent random vectors. Okay. So then the, uh, define the entropy power set function nu of s which is the entropy power of this subset sum and then define the d dimensional stam region so we call this the stam region in honor of stam who was the first to you know to prove the entropy power inequality and to show many other interesting things about entropy power so 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 the d dimensional stam region is the subset of r to the 2 to the n minus 1 defined by uh, defined as the collection of all entropy powers of subset sums corresponding to non empty subsets of the index set right so you if you fix, you know, when you fix uh, distributions of x1 through xn, you get one point in r to the 2 to the n minus 1, which is the entropy power of every single subset sum. And then as you vary these distributions, you are going to get a collection of points in r to the 2 to the n minus 1. That is exactly the d dimensional stam region. Okay? And then uh, in analogy with the definition of the entropy region, you, we can define the STAM region as the union of all these d-dimensional STAM regions as you, as you vary d over all the integers. Okay, this is sort of analogous to if you are looking at the entropy region constraining your alphabet size. You can think of this as analogous to that. You know, uh, we, we do not constrain an, uh, alphabet size when we look at entropy region. Similarly, we do not want to constrain dimension when we look at the STAM region. Okay, so uh, some remarks. So first of all, an immediate fact for any dimension d, the d-dimensional stam region is a cone and that just follows from the scaling property of entropy power. Since entropy power of a constant times x is a squared times the entropy power of x, this means that, I mean, and, and if you are looking at, you know, if, if, if you multiply the underlying random variables x1 through xn by some constant, Clearly, you are also multiplying any subset sum by the same constant, by distributivity of, uh, uh, you know, multiplication over addition. And, and as a result, you know, if you have any point in the d-dimensional stam region, then you can get any positive multiple of it just by scaling. Okay, so this is certainly, the d-dimensional stam region is certainly a cone. Is it obvious that it's additive? Sorry? So, uh, no, I am just saying that, yeah, I am just saying that, 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 you know, you, if, if you start off with x1 through xn and you multiply all of them by, you know, you, you go from here to ax1 through axn, then every possible subset sum, so if you look at ys, which is the sum i in s xi, this will get mapped to just a sub a times ys and so the, you know. Okay, so 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 it's a cone. Uh, so we we you know as one might expect, it's not easy to find exact characterizations of this cone, but we would like to find inner and outer bounds. So mimicking what we know about the entropy region, uh, and any inequality that gives an outer bound, we will call an entropy power inequality. So that will give us an outer bound on the stam region, okay? Because it's an inequality that must hold for every choice of uh, 
distributions for the underlying random vectors. And uh, so, so knowing the STAM region means in some sense knowing all entropy power inequalities that hold and all that don't hold. So there's a clear analogy of the problem of characterizing the entropy region, but you know, of course, that's, that's merely uh, a surface analogy, right? Because this is a very different object that we are studying here. We are trying to understand the differential entropies of sums of independent random vectors, which is a whole different ball game from understanding joint entropies. Okay. So, having motivated and, and posed the problem, I now want to uh, present some results about it. Yes, so, so that, that is one of our results that in fact uh, that is sufficient. So, so it's, it's not entirely obvious, but uh, it, uh, it is true that, uh, that, that, that basically gives you uh, at least the closure. The, the closure of the SAM region turns out to be that obtained by, I mean given by the EPI constraint. Okay. Yes. No, you cannot because for uh, for uh, okay, actually, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, 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 so you might be right. I'm actually not hundred percent sure of that. You might be right. Uh, so, okay, so uh, uh, so I need to introduce some terminology. So, uh, so first of all. If, if we look at uh, this index set 1 through n, I will call a hypergraph, so any collection of subsets, in other words, any subset of the power set, I'm going to call a hypergraph, and the sets in this collection, I'm going to call hyper edges. So this is uh, simply because if all of these sets had, had size 2, then I would think of these as edges of a graph, but now I'm thinking of you know, the edges as potentially having size larger than 2, so that we call that a hypergraph. So for, for any index i, the degree of i uh, is, is the number of sets in this hypergraph that contain that index. Okay? And then we can talk about fractional partitions using hypergraphs. So I will say that a, that a, a non-negative uh, real valued function on this uh, hypergraph is a fractional partition of the ground set uh, if, uh, so, so this is, uh, I mean, this is very much related to this notion of balanced inequalities that uh, that Terence and uh, uh, Terence talked about, and I think Tariq talked about a couple of days ago. So, so, so the so the picture here is that uh, I mean, if you look at this constraint here, the the sum of all uh, sum over all coefficients uh, corresponding to sets that contain j is equal to one for each index j. If you restrict your beta to be 0, 1 valued, then this is the indicator function of a partition. So you can, you can look for sets in this hypergraph C that form a partition of your ground set. And if you restrict beta to be 0, 1 valued, then it picks out partitions. Right? Any, any beta that satisfies this will be the indicator function of a partition. Uh, and allowing beta to be non-integer valued is basically uh, doing some sort of fractional relaxation of the notion of a partition. So we'll call it a fractional partition. Uh, uh, and one way to visualize this is that you're associating with each, uh, you know, okay, so, so we have, so we have uh, you know, one, one up to n here. This is our ground set. We have the hypergraph here. These are subsets, S1, S2, et cetera. SK, these are subsets, these are all subsets of the ground set. And then we can, we can draw a containment graph, right? Uh, so for example, if S1 contains 1 and uh, 3, then, then we are going to draw edges to 1 and 3 and so on. Then the degree that I talked about there, the degree of an index is just the degree in this, in this bipartite graph, the degree of an index here is just the number of sets that contain it, which justifies that terminology. And then what this uh, notion of fractional partition does is it associates with each of these sets some coefficients. And then if you look at all the indices from 1 to n, what this is saying is that if you look at all sets in this hypergraph which contain 1, and you just fill up a bucket corresponding to this index 1, 
with the beta s for each s that contains one, then in the end you end up exactly filling the bucket, right? So that's that's uh, that's how we understand these things. And then uh, here is a is a basic uh, example. So if you look at our regular hypergraphs, that is, if you have a hypergraph such that the degree of each index is r, then uh, one over r is a fractional partition for the, using this hypergraph. Okay, so elementary fact. All right, so, so now uh, having defined hypergraphs and fractional partitions, I can define the notion of fractionally super additive functions. So a set function defined on a 2 to the square bracket n, so on all subsets of uh, 1 through n, is fractionally super additive if, uh, if the set function mu on, on uh, the value that it takes on the full set is at least equal to the linear combination of values that it takes using uh, any fractional partition, okay? So I take any fractional partition using this collection C here, and uh, uh, if, if, if such an inequality holds, then I say that mu is fractionally super additive. So let's note one special case. If you take, if you take the hypergraph here to be the set of all singletons, then one choice of fractional partition there is just the fractional partition which puts which gives weight one to each singleton. That's a fraction. That's a partition, and in fact, it's and hence a fractional partition. And then this recovers super additivity. So this is a this is a this is a you know a function is fractionally super additive if it is super additive and then satisfies these additional you know inequalities as well corresponding to all other fractional partitions. Also, a set function is super modular if the function applied to the union of two sets plus the function applied to the intersection is at least uh, the sum of the values on the two sets. This is something that is perhaps more familiar. We've seen submodularity, which is the negative of this a lot recently. And then here is a, uh, is a basic fact relating these two classes. So if you have a supermodular set function which takes the value zero at the empty set, then mu must be fractionally super additive. Okay, so this fact is actually implicit in uh, results in cooperative game theory in the 50s and 60s. Uh, if you combine results of Bondareva, Shapley, and Kelly, then you can recover this result. Special cases were also uh, rediscovered by Hahn in 1978. That's called Hahn's inequality. By Chung, Graham, Frankel, and Shearer in 1986. That's called Shearer's inequality. And by Friedgut in 2004. And uh, uh, I, I forgot to mention one more. So, so this explicit statement was first, uh, I mean, this statement was first explicitly stated by Mula, Nolanier, and Pinchon in uh, 1986, I believe. Uh, and for the most general version of the statement, slightly more general w than this, and a simple proof, there's a paper that uh, Prasad Tetali and I wrote uh, uh, a few years ago that, that, uh, that, uh, that recounts all this and also the history of this result. Okay. It's not hard to show. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's five lines, but it will take us away from the point of today's talk. So I I won't. Uh. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So so here's our first result. Uh, if you look at, if if we def if we denote by gamma FSA of n, the class of all fractionally super additive set functions. On, uh, on a ground set of size n, then the STAM region is a subset of this, of this class. So in other words, every point in the STAM region is uh, fractionally super additive. Okay? So this, this is a significant refinement of the entropy power inequality, which just states super additivity. Right? So in fact, not only is super additivity true, which is already implied by the entropy power inequality, which I don't have on the board, but, uh, but fractional superadditivity is true for the, for the entropy power of sums. And uh, here, here, this fact is written down as an inequality. So, so what this is saying is that if you have independent random vectors in Rd, uh, x1 through xn, then for any fractional partition using any collection of, uh, using any hypergraph, you have that the entropy power of the full sum is at least this linear combination of entropy powers of subset sums. Okay, and moreover, if 
uh, if these xi's turn out to be Gaussian with proportional covariance matrices, then you get equality here. Okay, so this is sharp. Uh, so, so this uh, result was conjectured uh, in a paper with Andrew Barron in 2010, uh, and we had proved, uh, you know, we had almost proved this. We had proved. Uh, uh, I, I will, I will tell you what we proved in a minute, uh, and we completed the proof in a paper with uh, with Farhad Ghasemi uh, a couple of years ago. Okay, so so here is the result uh, that we had proved with Barron. Uh, which states that if you look at any hypergraph that covers n, that is, there is at least one hyperedge in this hypergraph which contains every element in the index set, then uh, this inequality holds where r plus of c, uh, I should have, I haven't defined r plus of c, but r plus of c here is the maximum degree in c. So it's the maximum degree of any index in this hypergraph. Okay? So if you look at the special case of singletons, then uh, you know every uh, uh, every index has degree one. If you look at singletons, right? Uh, so so here my hypergraph is just the singletons. The sets here are just the singletons. Clearly, you know this is just uh, you know this is just uh, parallel lines, right? That's what this graph looks like. So the degree is one, and you recover the entropy power inequality. Okay, if you take uh, if you take the hypergraph to be the set of all leave one out sets, that is the set of all sets of size n minus 1, then r is n minus 1, the degree is n minus 1 for each index, uh, which means that you get this uh, entropy power inequality here, which relates the entropy power of the full sum to the entropy power of the leave one out sums, okay, with a coefficient of n minus 1. And this was first proved by uh, Shiri, Artstein, Keith Ball, Frank Barth, and Asaf Naor in 2004. And it was a very celebrated result because this implies this monotonicity of entropy in the central limit theorem that I mentioned earlier, and this settled an old conjecture. Uh, and later on, simpler proofs of this result were given by Tulino and Verdu and by us with Andrew Barron. Uh, and this result has, I mean, these, these, these uh, okay, I should say that this uh, subset sum entropy power inequality has also found applications in information theory, the study of secrecy and so on. Okay, so um, so so this is uh, this is this is an inequality we proved earlier, and the main idea here was uh, you know I don't want to go into it; it's now an older result, but uh, but you know it proceeded by the usual way that uh, entropy that the proof of entropy power inequalities proceeds, which is to start with uh, proving something for Fisher information, and then. You know, integrating that along the Onstein and Lindbeck semigroup to get inequalities for entropy. The hard thing is to prove something for the right thing for Fisher information, and there it turns out that, that there are some tricks that were introduced by Artstein, Ball, Barth, and Naur, namely a variance drop inequality, which turns out to be extremely useful, and uh, that can be used to prove this uh, subset sum entropy power inequality. So, so the way that we prove the more general inequality involving fractional partitions is to basically reduce the more general inequality to this one. And uh, so, so here is a proof outline. So, so we want to prove that an entropy power inequality holds for coefficients coming from any fractional partition on the ground set. And the idea here is to consider the space of fractional partitions. You know, instead of thinking of a fractional partition as just being defined on a hypergraph, I can just define it on the full power set. Right, just setting it to be equal to zero at, for those sets which are not in the hypergraph that I'm interested in. Right? And then, then this is just you know, the set of all fractional partitions is defined by a bunch of linear constraints, and so it's a polytope. Okay? So it turns out to be a polytope uh, in, uh, in uh, R to the in whatever uh, appropriate dimensional space. And by the krein millman theorem, it must be the convex hull of its extreme points. So all that I need to do uh, in order to prove the, this uh, fractional entropy power inequality, I only need to prove it for fractional partitions which are extremal uh, in this polytope, the extremal fractional partitions. Then one can show that the extremal fractional partitions must be rational valued, that is the coefficients must be rational numbers. And once we do that, one can show that you know, since these are rational numbers, you can basically recover them by uh, taking multiple copies of, you know, so it turns out that this, that this inequality that I wrote down here works even if you repeat the sets S, 
So you can take multi hypergraphs, not just hypergraphs. You can you can take repetitions of the set. And so if we if we if we do that and we we just have to count the degrees appropriately, keeping in mind that you are repeating the sets, then uh, you can basically reduce it to this earlier subset sum entropy power inequality with Baron, and uh, therefore we have proved this fractional superadditivity of entropy power. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, I'm going much slower than I anticipated, but that's okay. I'll uh, maybe I'll skip the proofs. So. Uh, so one natural question, having proved this fractional superadditivity and keeping in mind that the supermodular functions uh, are automatically fractionally superadditive, is whether the supermodular functions also provide an outer outer bound for the stam region. Right? This turns out to be false. Okay? So that, in some sense, the analog of submodularity of entropy for entropy powers of sums does not hold, and uh, so, so more precisely, the minute you go to dimension more than one, so if you go to dimension two and at least three random variables, so the d-dimensional stam region, the two-dimensional stam region for three random variables contains points which are not supermodular. Okay, which are not supermodular set functions. And to prove that, we can just restrict ourselves to Gaussians. So when we restrict ourselves to Gaussians, the entropy power of a subset sum just becomes the determinant to the one over d of the sum of uh, subset sum of positive definite matrices. Okay, so you can look at S1 through Sn, which are positive definite matrices, which are the covariance matrices of these Gaussians, and then the entropy power of the subset sum is just the determinant to the one over d of the corresponding subset sum of the positive definite matrices. And uh, to and here's a counterexample. So if we take these three two by two matrices then uh, it, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go over it, but it's a two minute, you know, we can just read off the determinants here and you will see that uh, supermodularity for the square root of the determinant fails for these two by two matrices. Okay, so, uh, so we have said some things about what, something that we know is an outer bound for the SAM region, something that we don't know is an outer, uh, that we know is not an outer bound for the SAM region. The next question is whether we have convexity properties. Okay, so, so unfortunately, we don't know if the stam region is convex, but it does turn out to have a kind of convexity property, not the stam region itself, but its closure. So we can show that the closure of the stam region is a log convex cone in R to the two to the n minus one. So what do we mean by log convex? We mean that if we take any two, so a set is a log convex. If if uh, if you take any two points in the set, then the geometric means of the coordinates are in the set instead of the instead of the arithmetic means okay so so in other words the if if you take the log logs of the coordinates that's a convex set so this makes sense only if my set is a subset of the positive orthent but my set is a subset of the positive orthent so so that's fine okay all right so uh, so so incidentally i mean it's so log convexity is not directly comparable to convexity but log convexity does imply orthogonal convexity, which means convexity along lines that are parallel to coordinate uh, axes, right? So for example, you know, this set here is not convex, but it is orthogonal convex in the sense that if you take any two points that are connected by a line parallel to one of the coordinate axes, then everything on that line segment is in the set, right? So. Uh, so, so, so you know, the stam region could be something like that in principle. Um, okay, so, so I, I haven't been able to find a lot of sort of general theory of log convex sets and so on. So, if if anyone knows of anything like that, I would be curious. It doesn't seem to have been that much studied, although uh, these you know log convex domains do come up in complex analysis. Uh, Uh, yes, yes. Is, is there a more precise characterization of it? Or are you looking at definitions? Do you think there's infinitely many inequalities through these choices of gradient? Yes, yeah. Is there a more precise representation? For the, for the fractional super additive? Uh, so, yeah, so, so, so you can, I mean, it is, uh, it is as I said, a polytope. Uh, and. 
Yeah, because because there are finitely many extremal uh, fractional partitions, and and so so this is this is actually an interesting question as well. So so the complexity of this grows exponentially with n, uh, and this this has been studied in uh, in economics actually because uh, you know in cooperative game theory these notions uh, come up a lot. And going back to Shapley, people have tried to understand this structure of these extremal fractional partitions and so on. And I wouldn't say that it's very well, well understood. There's probably more to do there. You said it's n-point space. It's finite to many n. There's only finite to many n inequalities. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, so th th that's what I'm saying. I mean, there, there are algorithms, but they are, uh, you know, these are exponential in n. So uh, the, the, even the number, the number is like grows very fast with n. So OK. So uh, let me also say that in small dimension, we can say some things. So for example, in dimension two, as Babak guessed, uh, the closure of the STAM region in dimension, I mean, not dimension two, but when you have two, uh, when your ground set has size two, so you're looking at sums of two things, okay? The, the closure of the STAM region uh, is actually a closed convex polyhedral cone, which is just the fractionally super additive things on a ground set of size 2, which is the same as the super additive things on a ground set of size 2. No fractional needed. Okay? But for n3 uh, onwards, the closure of the STAM region is a strict subset of the fractionally super additive things. And in fact, I believe it's lower dimensional. So, so it's really a, you know, very much a strict subset. And one way of seeing that is to, is to observe this general, pro is to use this general property, which actually does not not just holds an RD, but in any locally compact group. Uh, so the, the entropy of uh, sums of independent random variables in any locally compact group is actually submodular. So if you look at entropy powers, you have a multiplicative relationship between the entropy powers when you are looking at three things. And this is a constraint. <coughs> you know, this is a strange kind of constraint that, uh, that turns up. So. Okay, uh, so, so uh, I, sh I, uh, okay, so, so, uh, so I, I believe this comes from the fact that, uh, you know, if you know something about some coordinates of the STAM region, that can force. So, so for example, if you know that some coordinates of the STAM region are uh, additive in terms of their components, that forces all those random variables to be Gaussian. Okay, and that forces things for for other coordinates, and they so so uh, so so I believe uh, uh, I, I mean I, I haven't I haven't quite worked out the uh, dotted the i's and crossed the t's, but uh, but uh, but if I'm right, then uh, it should be a lower dimensional region. Um, not for three. So so okay. So for for three, uh, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay. OK, so uh, I will just mention briefly uh, that the closure of the STAM region also has a nice description as an infinite dimensional STAM region. So instead of looking at finite dimensional random vectors, you could look at stochastic processes indexed by the natural numbers and then look at entropy rates of these processes when they exist. OK, and you can look at entropy rates of sums of independent stochastic processes, you know, an exact analogy. And then it turns out this is not entirely trivial to show that the closure of the STAM region is actually the STAM region corresponding to the entropy rates of uh, you know, n independent uh, stochastic processes uh, indexed by the natural numbers. So, so that's a nice physical interpretation of the, uh, of the closure of the STAM region. This topological closure is the same thing as extending the definition of the STAM region to infinite dimensional random vectors in some sense. Okay, so. Quickly, let me mention some open questions. We don't know if the closure of the STAM region is convex. This is open. Uh, the fractional superadditivity of the STAM region implies by linear programming duality that if you look at the region of all R1 through Rn, non-negative real numbers satisfying these constraints, that the subset sums of these Ris is at least the entropy power of the subset sum. Uh, then, uh, then there exists a point in this region such that the total sum is equal to the entropy power of the total sum. 
okay this is kind of analogous this, this is the th these kinds of rate regions show up all the time in information theory for example the sleepy and wolf problem or the multiple access problem and so on and and uh, for the sleepy and wolf problem it is the fractional sub fractional subadditivity of entropy which is a co which is a consequence of the submodularity of entropy which guarantees that uh, that you know the joint entropy is actually the fundamental limit in the sleepy and wolf problem so this is kind of a backwards question, but is there a communication problem for which this is the rate region? I mean, if there is, this is saying something about the fundamental limit of the sum, fundamental, you know, sum rate or something for this problem. But I don't know. I don't know if there is such an such a communication problem. But it's curious. Another open question. So. Uh, we observed that if you look at the determinant of these, you know, if you specialize to the Gaussian case, then you have that the determinant to the 1 over d is not supermodular, but it turns out that the determinant itself without raising to the 1 over d is supermodular. In other words, if you look at the set function which goes from a subset to the exponential of twice the entropy without dividing by dimension, actually, um, yeah, exactly, without dividing by dimension, this is supermodular when x1 through xn are Gaussian. So the question is, how much can this be generalized? Okay. So what we know is that this is not supermodular in general. But what we also know is that for if you look at the volume analog of this entropy phenomenon, so if AI are convex sets in RD, then the corresponding, you know, the volume of this Minkowski subset sum is supermodular. This is something that was proved with Matthew Fradelizzi, Arno Marsilietti, and Artem Zwavich. So the natural conjecture analogous to this would be that if x1 through xn are log concave distributions, then the exponential of twice the entropy of the subset sum is actually a supermodular set function. We don't know. OK, so uh, with that, I will uh, close by just saying that uh, this seems to be an interesting problem, which potentially has lots of applications to information theory but all, and also to probability and so on. Uh, this problem of characterizing the STAM region. We know a few things about the STAM region, namely that the fractionally superadditive uh, set functions provide an outer bound to it, and the supermodular functions do not provide an outer bound to it. Uh, uh, but, but there are plenty of open questions. I'll close with that. Thank you. <laughs>